بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في القرآن الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين آمنوا أشد حبا لله وقال تعالى في مقام آخر النبي أولى بالمؤمنين من أنفسهم وأزواجه, وأزواجه أمهاتهم صدق الله سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا ومولانا محمد وبارك وسلم أكون رسائد رود شريف صلوات اللهم صل على سيدنا وعلى آل سيدنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم يا فاتح الخير يا فتاح وبك نستعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله today we start a new discussion a new subject a new topic recently we finished a brief overview of the sira the life and the times of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم we familiarized ourselves a little with the chronology the time order or and the life events during the time of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and today inshallah we begin discussing the topic of حب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عشق رسول صلى الله عليه وسلم love for Sayyiduna Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم throughout inshallah this series we're going to touch on many different discussion points inshallah and my hope is that this will bring a desire and a passion into my and all of our lives to try and connect with Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم on an even deeper level we studied the seerah of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam over perhaps almost a year. And inshallah, the hope is now that we can try to get to the next level. Having discussed things superficially, that we go down a further layer. And inshallah, as we progress, you know, there are, there are other reasons as well for having these discussions. And as we continue and as we progress, inshallah, I'll touch on these where they're relevant as well, insha'Allah ta'ala. The first thing that I want to talk about is that Allah ta'ala has created certain forces of attraction amongst his makhluk, amongst his creation. And when this attraction exists between two inanimate objects, bejan chizun ke darmiyan, then this is called, for example, if it's between metals, then it's called magnetism. Or you could also say that gravity is an example of this, an attraction between inanimate objects. Okay. However, when this attraction exists between living beings, then this is something called affection or mailan. Arabic and Urdu, the same word, mailan. This is illustrated well by the Arabic proverb, proverb al-jinsu yamilu il al-jins, that a being is attracted towards its like, towards its own, towards its elk. A being is attracted towards its own elk. And as this affection intensifies and as it grows, it becomes love, something which is called mahabba or hub in the Arabic language. So, Let's talk a little more about how we understand and define these terms, mahabba and hub. Now, first of all, the root and the origin of the word mahabba is the word habba, habbatun, that's uh, on the top, bottom left of the screen. Okay, so the, the root, it's derived from habba. Okay, and habba literally translates to the literal meaning of habba is a seed. Is a seed. Seed kordu me kya kehte hain? Beej. Beej. Okay, and a seed. If we talk about what a seed is, a seed is such a thing that takes root when it's planted into the ground, when it's nourished by sunshine and rain, and as a result of this, fragrant flowers and sweet fruits they come forth as a result. In the same way. When the seed of mahabba, the seed of love, is planted in the human heart, it starts to flourish. It puts down roots 
and slowly it encompasses the entire being. In researching this, I found that the ulama in nafsiyat, the, what we would call psychologists in this modern day age, before they were given a name, psychologist, ulama in nafsiyat, they actually agree that the word muhabba applies to the inclination of the heart towards a desired object. Dil ka mailan kisi mahboob cheez ki taraf. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he defined muhabba as a human being's natural inclination towards such an object which gives joy. Towards such an object which gives joy. And what happens as a result is that this attraction turns into infatuation as the, de as the desire increases in the heart. And as the desire increases in the heart, the heart becomes restless and uneasy. This restlessness continues to grow until thoughts of the mahboob, thoughts of the beloved, consume the lovers, the ashik's entire being. And if they are separated from the object of mahabba, the, the mahboob, then that becomes unbearable and the heart remains dissatisfied, constantly craving more. As a result, the lover's thoughts, they become one with the mahboob. The mahboob's happiness becomes the lover's happiness. And the wants of the mahboob, they become the wants of the lover. And these are all the results of mahabba. These are all the results of mahabba. Now, why do we need love? Why do we need love in our society? Why has Allah Ta'ala created love? First of all, we are social beings. We are social beings and muhabba forms the foundation of a community. Why? Because hearts become drawn to one another. And that is how a community is strengthened. And intentions of the heart and mind, they strengthen muhabba and attraction. And attraction grows so that the lover becomes absorbed in the beloved. What happens as a result is that a constant burning feeling is ignited within the lover and the heart becomes content with handing, handling any difficulties, any anxieties for the sake of his beloved. As a person begins to see the effects of mahabba, what happens is that hardship, mashakkat, musibate, difficulties, struggles, they become easy to handle. That I love Allah, for example, our primary, the primary object of our mahabba and our love should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because of my love for Allah, all hardship that comes my way, all difficulties that become my way, they become trivial. Why? Because I'm too engrossed in the love of my Allah. What is difficult when I have my Allah? This becomes the mindset. And as a result, what happens is that the heart becomes preoccupied with the thoughts of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to getting closer to the beloved, going back to speaking generically. And thoughts other than that of the beloved, they begin to melt away into the background. Many muhaqqiqeen, many researchers and ulama, they hold the view that muhabba despite our efforts just there, it's not something that can be defined and explained. Why? Because if I try to explain muhabba to you, I need to use muhabba to explain. Muhabbat ki tarif bayan karne ke liye, muhabbat hi istamal karni padegi. Kaise bayan kar sakte How can you explain something that you are unable to explain without using the explained term? Meaning it's not something that you can put into words However, despite that, many have tried. Okay, many have tried to put uh, to put this into words. Many of the mashayikh, they've tried to give an explanation of what muhabbat and what love is in order to benefit the students, the salikin, the people that are on the path of spirituality, the path of deen and becoming um, someone that embodies the shariat and the sunnah. This is one term, muhabbat, is the phrase that's commonly used. Another term that we might have heard when talking about love of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Ishq. You might have heard Ishq Rasul. Now, what is this Ishq? Okay. Ishq literally means, the definition literally of Ishq is the attachment 
of the heart to something. The attachment of the heart to something. And it comes literally from the word ashaqa. Okay. And ashaqa actually refers to a specific type of plant that dries up and becomes yellow after staying green for a certain period of time. In Hindi, in Hindi, the, the term ishqi pecha is given to a plant, a weed, a parasitic plant, a weed that takes over and kills everything that it encircles. And as a result, it renders its prey dull and yellow. And it said that in the same way, ishq is said to make the body weak and pale the body when it enters into the heart. Ishq ka kya hai ke bande ka jism kamzor ho jata hai, uski ho shor jati hai, kamzor ho jata hai, khana peena bool jata hai, mahboob ki yaad mein kya kya nahi hota. To isi tarah ye jo ishq pecha ka jo pauda hai, ye kya kehta hai, ye apne irdgir jo bhi hota hai, usko tabao barbaad kar deta hai, usko suka deta hai, usko sar sab se usko peela kar deta hai. Now, having mentioned that some also hold the view that the word ishq, it's not derived from any other word. Meaning it in Arabic for the students is غير مشتق, okay? For the students of uh, Sarf and Nahwa, uh, it's غير مشتق, it's not min al-mushtaqat, okay? So it's not derived from any other word, but in fact, it's a root word in itself. And supporting this is the fact that the word ishq has not been used anywhere in the Holy Quran. And a possible reason that's been given for this is because the word ishq was slightly unpalatable. In the original Khalis and pure Arabic. In the book Qamus, ishq has been defined as part of madness. Junoon ka kuch hissa. Ishq ki tarif kai gai hai. Qamus naam hai kitab ka. And Sheikh Muhyiddin ibn Arbi Arabi, rahimahullah, he said that the word ishq has been represented by the word mahabba, love, in the Holy Quran. For example, Allah Ta'ala has said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ That those of iman, those of faith, they are overflowing shadeed. They are overflowing in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as is mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, with the word hub being used in the word mahabba being used. Now, mahabba and ishq. The question arises that is there a difference between these two terms or are they one and the same thing? In trying to explain ishq, people have said that ishq is the name given to intense love. Okay, but Alama Ibn, uh, Ibn Mansur rahimahullah, said in Lisan al-Arab, which is a famous, very uh, lexicon of the Arabic language, uh, essentially a big dictionary, he has mentioned, Al-ishqu fartu al-hubbi waqila huwa ajabu al-muhibbi bil-mahbubi yakunu fi yakunu fi afaf al-hubbi wa da'aratihi that Ishq is the superlative, it is the extreme and exaggerated form of muhabba. And it's said that it is extreme preoccupation with the beloved. And the preoccupation can result and can both be clean and unclean, or it can be pure, or it can be filthy. One Shaykh, Shaykh Ahmad ibn Yahya, rahimahullah, he was asked, which of the two conditions, Ishq, and mahabba is more praiseworthy. Which one is more praiseworthy? Zyada fazilat kis mein hai? Ishq mein ya mahabbat mein? And his reply was that mahabba. Why? Because ishq can become excessive. Ishq mein banda bohut dur ja sakta hai. Mahabbat, yani ek kafiyat hai jo, yani mortadal kafiyat hai. It doesn't go to excess. The same topic, continuing with that, Many have said that ishq is a fire. Given trying to explain it, trying to give it some sort of example and meaning that people can relate to. Sheikh Makhdoom Sharifuddin Ahmad rahmatullahi replied to this that if ishq was a fire, then a lover's face would not be drowned in tears. 
if ishq was a fire then the lover's face would not be drowned in tears agar ishq ek aag hoti to phir aashiq ka chehre aashiq ka chehra aansu se nahi bhara hota zahir hai aag aur pani to mutazad cheeze hain saath saath ek saath kaise maujood ho sakti hain some have said the ishq is water to which the sheikh replied that hearts would not be burning with ishq if this were the case kalimatul hikma dhalatul mu'min that these are wise words it's not quran it's not hadith it's just some wise words uh, and that's uh, the lost property of the mu'min as it comes in the hadith okay and uh, some have said that it's a poison ishq is a poison he replied that but if this is true then how is it that thousands of ashiqeen thousands of lovers thousands of usha they are shouting and crying out of their love and desire out of their ishq and they're not dead poison kills you some have said again that ishq is hardship but then mashaqqat but why is it that people are willing to give their lives and comforts up in exchange for hardship the person that's living his best life why would he exchange that for hardship and some have also said that ishq is luxury and if ishq is luxury then the response is why do hearts burn because of it in summary everyone has tried to explain ishq in his or her own way but no explanation is able to completely explain it or to come close my understanding of ishq is that it's a strong emotion that overwhelms the aashiq and so he yearns to unite with his beloved thereby losing himself in the process inshallah we'll talk more about this but in summary ishq is a commonly used term when it comes to the subject of hubbur rasul ishq e rasul ishq e nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam but uh, and it's very closely linked to mahabba as well but the terminology used in the holy quran is the terminology of hub and mahabba now there's no doubt that allah taala is the creator the sustainer of the entire universe he's the most deserving and worthy of the greatest love why because allah taala possesses the greatest the best the most amazing qualities which have no limit no end and which cannot be counted which cannot be enumerated it is only allah subhanahu wa taala that showers down his ni'am his bounties his favors and ni'mats on his servants from his unlimited te- treasures and there are such bounties blessings favors that if we try even if we were to try we could never truly comprehend the favors of allah subhanahu wa taala the count the favors of allah subhanahu wa taala on us allah taala says in the quran wa in ta'uddu ni'mat allah la tuhsuha that if you wish to count the bounties of allah the ni'mats of allah you can never count them you can never include them all you can never encompass them all this phrase la tuhsuha that you will not be able to encompass them from all of the favors and blessings that allah taala has given each of us we are only able to recognize a minuscule amount we don't have time otherwise i would i would elaborate on this but la tuhsuha points to the same fact and there is no doubt that out of all of the makhluq our nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has the greatest right to be loved and in fact he has a greater right and is more deserving of our love than our own selves allah taala says in the quran an nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim wa azwajuhu ummahatuhum that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam has a greater right over the believers than their own selves and his wives are their mothers the ummahatul mu'minin the meaning of this phrase that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has a greater right over the believers an nabiyu awla bil mu'minin as mentioned by many mufassirin hazm al nashraf ali thani rahmatullah alayhi mention it's also the view of imam qurtubi rahimahullah and most mufassirin have preferred the view as well that every muslim is duty bound to obey the command of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam even more so than the command and the instruction of his parents so much so that if one's parents were to oppose a command of the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam then they are obedience in that matter is not permissible it's not jais likewise implementing the command of nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam takes precedence over the pulls and the fancies of your own nafs and your desires 
in a hadith of Sayyiduna Abu Huraira, anhu, which is narrated in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, and others, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, ma min mu'minin illa wa ana awla nasi bihi fi dunya wal akhira iqra'u in shi'tum an nabiyu awla bil mu'minin min anfusihim that there is no believer, no such believer for whom I am not the closest of all people in this dunya and in the akhira. Read if you wish this verse of the Quran to confirm that the Prophet, the Nabi, has a greater right over the believers than their own, self, own selves. The sense of this statement is that Nabi Wasallam's affection for every Muslim exceeds the affection of the whole world. And as such, the necessary outcome has to be that nothing other than every mu'min and every believer holding Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dearer than everything else is what is expected and required. There's also something in another hadith which mentions لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من والده وولده والناس أجمعين that none of you can truly believe until I, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying until I become the dearest one to him dearer than his father his son, and the rest of all the human beings. This is Muttafaq Ali Hadith mentioned by Imam Bukhari and Muslim. Now, whoever has truly recognized Rasulullah will not only know the reality, but will also feel practically that whichever qualities you know, compel them to love Rasulullah they are found in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to the most perfect level and they are not found in uh, any other person to that level meaning whatever quality makes you love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he has the most of it he has the best of it no other person can come close and the imams of ilm of ma'rifa of mahabba they've briefly divided these into two main parts in other words the main causes of love that you love someone because of either their great qualities, their perfect characteristics, their akhlaq, the way they conduct themselves, what they do. You love them because of the way they are, you know, the way they look, their appearance, their characteristics, their qualities. Number one, or number two, that you love someone because of their generosity towards you, their ihsan towards you, the fact that they are kind towards you, and so on and so forth. They have done good to you. Now, Let's talk about these. Number one is that being imbued with perfect qualities and characteristics, a cause of love. What about love due to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's perfect qualities and characteristics? A lover loves another because at times they, it is due to their beautiful form or their wonderful voice or their beauty. These are all attractive qualities. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his natural form, his build, his beauty, he surpasses the whole of the makhluk. It's been narrated, in fact, with tawatur, with mass transmission and succession, and with great conviction from the Sahaba, anhum, that, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ أَحْسَنَ النَّاسِ وَجْهًا وَأَحْسَنَهُ خَلْقًا That Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم was the most handsome person in terms of his facial features and his bodily features as well. Meaning the Prophet ﷺ was beautiful, handsome. In another hadith, Hazrat Hind ibn Abi Hala who said that كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فخما مفخما يتلألأ وجهه تلألأ القمر ليلة البدر سبحان الله رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم was magnificent in himself and he was also magnificent in the sight in the nazar of others as well. His face would shine like the radiance and the brightness of the full moon. Subhanallah. Hazrat Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that مَا رَأَيْتُ شَيْئًا أَحْسَنَ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ كَأَنَّ الشَّمْسَ تَجْرِي فِي وَجْهِ That I never saw anyone more handsome than Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم and it was as though the sun was revolving around his blessed face. It was as if كَي سُورَ جَعَبْ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ كَي چَهْرِ كَي اِرْدْ گُمْرَةَ تَ اتنے خوبصورت تھے آپ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم حضرت انس ابن مالک رضی اللہ عنہ سید سبحان اللہ ما مسستو حریرا ولا دیباجا 
aliyana min kaffi rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wala shamamtu miskatan wala wala abiratan atyaba raihatan min raihati rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I have not laid hands on any type of silk tibaj and harir or harir and tibaj they are thin silk and thick silk thick silk patla resham gada resham I have not laid hands on any silk softer than the palm of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The palm of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Nor have I smelt any musk or amber types of perfume, which was more sweet smelling than the fragrance of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And in fact, another narration mentions that in fact, more fragrant than the perspiration of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In fact, whoever described Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was compelled to state Lam ara qablahu wa la ba'dahu mithlahu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I never saw anyone before him or after him that was like him. Aap sallallahu alayhi wa sallam jaysa kabhi nahi dekha mani. Na un se pehle, na un se baad. I never seen anyone that was like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam neither before nor after him. This was his companion sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it becomes clear that if you love the beauty of the creation, it becomes binding on you to love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than that creation and even yourself since the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam succeeds and supersedes and surpasses every type of beauty and every type of positive quality found in people. Think about Allah Ta'ala's declaration. وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَذِينٍ That indeed you are on or you are of a lofty character. The conclusion is that we will eventually reach that whatever lofty character, whatever perfect qualities exist, they cannot match the character and the sublime conduct of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And one of the reasons that's mentioned here, Allah Khuluqin Adim, the word Allah points to something elevated, Ulu. It means to be above something. So there is no character and no perfection in any person except Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam occupies a greater rank and greater status. So that is being imbued with perfect qualities and characteristics. What about the other cause of love, a second cause of love, which is due to generosity, due to favours? The second cause for loving someone is that they have done good to you. They have benefited you. They have done been generous to you. They have shown some favour and some ihsan to you. You know, a person loves someone that benefits them in the dunya. Even if they just benefit him once or twice, ek ya do bar madad kar le, fayda de, koi ihsan kar le, banda uska aashik ho jata hai. In Arabic, the proverb, al insanu abdul ihsan. There's a famous Arabic saying that the human being is a slave to kindness. If someone is good to you, you are in their servitude. Now, no matter how much and how valuable this bounty, this blessing might be, it will eventually perish. It will eventually come to an end. For example, if one person saves another person from some difficulty in which he could have been destroyed, he could have come to some serious harm, then that will mean that you'll naturally develop affection and love for that person. Even though the benefit is short-lived, it's not everlasting. They won't always be there to protect you, so to speak. Then how can this ever compare? How can it ever compare with the Honorable Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the great messenger of Allah Ta'ala, who was a combination of beautiful character and honor, who Allah Ta'ala granted a beautiful personality, amazing attributes, all the encompassing virtues, due to whose blessings Allah Ta'ala took us out from the darkness of kufr to the light of iman, and who saved us from the zulmat of jahalat and led us to the nur of ma'rifat and yaqeen. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the cause of our everlasting, insha'Allah, enjoyment and Jannah. Can there be any favor which is greater and more virtuous than this? More virtuous than this? I don't think so. <laughs> so how can we fulfill the Prophet Sallallahu rights and thank him? The real answer is that Allah and his Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are deserving of our complete and perfect love. Going back to that ayat, and Nabiu Aula bil Mu'minina min Anfusi. And one longer ayah, ayah of Surah Tawbah, 
it comes, and in the interests of time, I'll just put the translation on the screen, that say, if your parents, your children, your brothers, your spouses, your families, your wealth that you have earned, the business whose closure you fear, and the houses that you are fond of, more beloved to you than Allah and his messenger, and striving in his path, then wait until Allah sends his command. Allah Ta'ala does not guide the disobedient ones. This ayat has drawn together all the various forms of love. Your parents, your children, your siblings, your spouses, your wealth, your houses and property. And the question to ask is, are these more beloved to me than Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? This is the question that we need to ask ourselves. So this ayah has made binding that the love of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dominates, trumps, supersedes the love of all of these things together. And there are many ahadith, many completely authentic a hadith which established the same point. The first hadith is narrated by both Imam Bukhari and Muslim from Hazrat Anas ibn Malik radiallahu that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولده ووالده والناس أجمعين that none of you can possess complete perfect iman until I am more beloved to him than his father, his son and all the people. And Imam Bukhari rahmatullahi alayhi as well as well as others have also narrated that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالَّذِي نَفْسِي بِيَدِي لَا يُؤْمِنُ أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى أَكُونَ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ وَالِدِهِ وَوَلَدِهِ That by that being, meaning I take qasam and oath by that being in whose control my life lies, none of you can truly believe until I am more beloved to him than his father and his child. Think about us that are sitting here. There's men sitting in front of me. There may be sisters and mothers listening at home. But man lives and strives, works and worries for who? His parents, his children, his family. They are usually the most loved people to him. Some people, ma'azallah, they are, due to this feeling, they are compelled to commit that which is haram due to this. They seek haram income because they want to provide for their, provide for their families. This is the extent to which they are driven. To mention them is to show in a way that is understood by me and you that love for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam must supersede every other love, meaning that Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam are our most beloved. They become our beloved, our most beloved. Someone could pose a question here that if you just focus on the love of Allah and His Rasul, do you just neglect everyone else? Go and sit in masjid. Say Allah, Allah all day. No. If you know deen, then you know that Allah Ta'ala and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam command you to be good to your wife, to be good to your children, to do their tarbiyah, to show respect to your elders and kindness to your youngsters. Our deen governs all of this. Our deen tells us who to show our love to as an extension of the love of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as an extension of the love of Allah first and foremost, and then Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this uh, is a moot point, so to speak. Now, to briefly continue in the few minutes that we have, love is of many types as well. Some of the most famous are, for example, the love of compassion and mercy, for which, for example, is the love of the father for his son. Another type of love is the love of respect and honor, which is, for example, the love of the son for his father and the love of the students for their teachers. Another type is natural love, tabi love, that the love that a man has for his wife. Number four is the love of humanity and well-wishing, khair khai, meaning the mutual love of all people. Generally speaking, you want well for one another. And number five, is love of oneself, loving yourself. This is actually the strongest type of love. And it's such a love which has been placed in the nature and the fitra, the fitrat of man since his creation, just as the love for others has also been placed. However, the love for oneself is also stronger than the love for anyone else, generally speaking. So there's a few points of reflection here. Up to here, there's some points of reflection. That we realize that Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam have emphasized that in the heart of a mu'min, our love for Allah and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam should be found to a greater extent 
than all other types of love. And this love should be above all other levels of love. And there is one way to achieve this, which is by pondering, deliberating and thinking about all those things which are mahboob to you, that are beloved to yourself, and then perceive your love for Rasulullah wasallam. And as a result, your intellect, your aql will compel you to accept that Nabi wasallam's love trumps your love for yourself. Let's take sabak and lesson of this point from the life of Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu. In this hadith of Bukhari Sharif, the Sahabi radiallahu anhu narrates that we were once in the company of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam held the hand of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu who remarked, Ya Rasulullah, you are more beloved to me than everything besides myself. To this, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied that no, I swear I take qasam by that being in whose control my life lies until I am not more beloved to you than even yourself. To this, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu then said, By Allah, now you are more beloved to me than my own self. And hearing this, Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam declared that, Ya Umar, now your iman is perfect. Let's think about this. Let's dissect this for a minute. Let's look at Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu's answer. Actually, the first answer, Pehla Jawab that he gave, that you are more beloved to me than everything besides myself, that was in accordance with the fitrat and the natural disposition that man has been created with. But when Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La, no, meaning that your iman is not perfect, that by that being in whose control my life lies, until I am not beloved to you than even yourself, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu then pondered over this statement. He did some introspection and he realized that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is more beloved to him than himself. And because Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the cause of your najat and your salvation and security from destruction in this dunya and in the akhirat, this was the reason that Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu then informed Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of the conclusion that he had reached after contemplation and he emphasized it with a qasam, with an oath. فَإِنَّهُ الْآنِ وَاللَّهِ لَأَنْتَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ نَفْسِي By Allah, now, al-an, you are more beloved to me than even my own self. Inshallah, just almost finish. How did Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respond to Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu's response? Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, al-an, ya Umar, now, O Umar, Ab, ya Umar, Ab, now, O oh Umar, you have attained correct recognition. You have understood the reality which was necessary to understand. So my friends, my respected elders, pondering over this love will lead us to conclude that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is the most deserving and worthy of our love. The cause of our remaining perpetually in existence and enjoying these everlasting bounties in the akhirah as well, and the happiness is only because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through whose means and wasta we got this beautiful deen. And this is the greatest and most superior type of benefit and goodness for us. And it's necessary to reserve our greatest portion of love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And for this love to be greater than our own nafs. Why? Because the benefit and goodness that we obtain from Allah by means of his Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is much greater than we obtain from others or even our own selves. And that just as Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the greatest person with regards to virtue and excellence, fazilat, azmat, he is the embodiment, the combination of the highest levels of excellence, virtues, blessings, goodness. He is the majmu'ah of khair. And for us as Ahli Iman, these facts are embedded into the depths of the soul and established in the recesses of our aql and intellect as well. But we need to dig them out. Why? Because as Muslims, we all possess love for Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in our hearts. And because it's not possible for Islam to enter the heart without this love for Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And coming to an end, we also do recognize, however, that people differ in this love for Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And mainly they differ in this love because of their level, level of contemplation and pondering on these bounties and blessings from Allah. 
by means of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. One reason. Another reason is because of their heedlessness and jahalat regarding Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not knowing who Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who he is, how he was, what he did, how he did it. And this is one of the reasons, my friends, that we have started talking about this subject today. Because, inshallah, after this, our next endeavor, which I hope will be even more fruitful, inshallah, having had this discussion, will be to study the Shamail of Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Shamail Muhammadiyah, meaning the virtues of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is a collection of hadith compiled by Imam Tirmidhi rahmatullahi alayhi, regarding the intricate, intricate, uh, intricate details of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's life, including his appearance, his belongings, his mannerisms, his conduct, how he would walk, how he would talk, and much, much more. So this is a lead up to that. This is a lead up to that. And one of the greatest ways as well, as well as this, the ulama say, that we can invite towards Allah Ta'ala is to make mention of the virtues and the excellences of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is something that we should do abundantly. Talk about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The fruits of this being that we will personally benefit by learning about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's virtues and Shamail and Fazail, and so will other believers. But also that if we make mention of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam openly and widely, then the hearts of non-Muslims will also become inclined and it will draw them closer to Deen-i Haqq, Deen-i Islam. And to end with, uh, just briefly speaking, a hadith narrated by Imam Bukhari and Muslim, that three qualities are such, in whomsoever they are found, that that person will taste the sweet sweetness and halawat of Iman. That number one, Allah and His Rasul وسلم, are more beloved to him than anything else. Number two, that he loves a person solely for Allah Ta'ala's sake. And three, that he dislikes to go back to kufr, just as he dislikes to be thrown into the fire. Meaning this is also a benefit of this love for Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And on a similar note, Imam Muslim Rahmatullah Ali has narrated another hadith that is of similar meaning, that that person has tasted the sweetness of Iman, who is pleased with Allah Ta'ala as his Rab, Rab Islam as his deen, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as his messenger. Radina billahi rabba wa bil islami deena wa bi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallama rasoolan wa nabiya. May Allah ta'ala make us all amongst these people who feel the sweetness of their iman and may Allah ta'ala make it such that Allah and his rasool become the most beloved to us and as a result we show love to those people that Allah ta'ala wants us to show love to as an extension of the love that we have for Allah and his rasool. Ameen. Inshallah. In the next session, we'll talk about how this love is substantiated, how it's verified, how it's shown to be true. It's not just a claim, empty words, bas dava e khali. In other words, walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Jesse Shair kata hai, kehte hai mere rag rag me hai nabi nabi, lekin parte hai namaz hafte me kabi kabi. Masjid ke liye sar katane ko tayar. لیکن مسجد میں سر جھکانے کو تیار نہیں نبی کریم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا نام سنتے ہی جھوم جاتے ہیں نبی کریم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم کا حکم سنتے ہی گوم جاتے ہیں so how do we show that we truly love Allah and his Rasul صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم انشاءاللہ we'll talk about that and also انشاءاللہ we'll talk about the symptoms of love and those things that stimulate and increase this love further May Allah Ta'ala accept these efforts in his court and may Allah Ta'ala forgive any shortcomings. I do apologize for running slightly over. Inshallah, our next session will be the week after next, Thursday 11th July, because next week, unfortunately, I won't be here. And inshallah, we'll pick up on this from then. Jazakumullah khairan. Wa akhiru da'wanan. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa